Daggerheart. The brainchild of Matt Mercer, one of the most influential and popular DMs of all time. Also, in unholy union between D&D &D and everything else. It introduces new mechanics like fear and hope. These are the core system that Daggerheart is built upon. That, plus a couple other things, make the analysis portion of Daggerheart, in terms of character build analysis, difficult. And significantly different than D&D. &D. Today I want to talk about that, the differences between the math of Daggerheart and D&D, &D, and I also want to provide some insight into how things are going, as well as provide a free resource for all of you Daggerheart players out there. If you're looking to level up your character and trying to figure out which options are best, well, I have a spreadsheet for you that I think you'll love. Now, let's get into the differences, starting with that fear-hope mechanic I was talking about. If you're unfamiliar, Daggerheart uses two d12s instead of one d20 when you're rolling any ability check or attack or whatnot. This means the number that you're going to get is going to go between 2 and 24 instead of 1 and 20. So yeah, the range is in fact different and higher. But not only that, instead the distribution of numbers is not equal. When you roll a d20, you have a 5% chance of having every number between 1 and 20. But when you roll two dice, you're much more likely to hit a number in the middle. For the number 2, you have to roll a 1 and a 1 on both of those d12s in order to get a 2. And that's the only combination of dice rolls that will get you a 2. For a 3, you could roll a 2 on a 1 die and a 1 on the other one, or you could flip that and roll a 2 on 1 and 1 on the other. So there are two outcomes where we get a 3. This keeps getting higher and higher until we reach number 13 and then it gets lower again. Hopefully it is more streamlined, where we see those amazing successes and those catastrophic failures, sometimes, but not as often. And critical hits are when your hope and your fear dice are the same number, so you roll doubles, essentially. This means the crit chance is 1 out of 12. That's higher than D&D's 1 out of 20. And I have seen crits a lot more in my Daggerheart games. So how is this different than 5e? Well. It's not that different. Both roll dice and you see how likely you are to hit. That's fine. What does seem different though is that you are more likely to hit in Daggerheart. Significantly more likely. Let's take for example a tier 0 skeleton. In Daggerheart, a skeleton has a difficulty of 10. That means a player needs to roll a 10 or higher on their attack in order to land a hit. Level 1 characters have plus 2 to hit. So that means they have to roll 8 or higher. Rolling an 8 or higher with 2d12 is actually an 87.5% chance of landing. That's really high, much higher than 5e. In 5e, our skeleton has an AC of 13, and a level 1 player has on average a plus 5 to their attack. So that means they also need to roll an 8 or higher in order to hit. But because of the way the dice work, we actually only have a 65% chance of landing this hit. And that's pretty typical. And I think that's a good thing because Players like to land attacks. Even if that attack doesn't do as much, they always want to feel like they did something. Now here's where the big math change comes in. Damage thresholds. And although we have an amazing chance to hit, damage thresholds tone that down and control the output of your character. Now, a quick summary of what damage thresholds are and how they work. In Daggerheart, you have three damage thresholds. A minor, a major, and a severe. When an enemy hits you, they will roll their damage, and they'll compare that damage to your damage thresholds. If the damage is under your minor threshold, you don't take any damage at all. If it's under your major threshold, but greater than or equal to your minor threshold, you take one damage. If it's less than your severe threshold, but greater than or equal to your major threshold, you take two points of damage. And if it's equal to or greater than your severe threshold, you take three points of damage. Now, I think this is probably the most significant change in Daggerheart. It has a lot of consequences that spread throughout the entire system, and I think things are based more around this than they are fear and hope. Now, I've heard the argument that damage thresholds don't really belong in this system. It's supposed to be rules light. I'm not here to discuss that. I just want to talk about the math behind it. The reason this math is so different is that when a character takes damage, usually in D&D we take the average damage. 
So let's say my character deals 1d8. Then I would say they deal on average 4.5 damage. And that's how much I would expect to deal to our enemies when I hit. But using damage thresholds, the average number that we get doesn't matter too much. In fact, it's more important that we understand the distribution of that damage, what the range of that damage is, and where that damage is most likely to fall in that range. Let's say, for example, we have a player with a minor threshold of 1, a major threshold of 6, and a severe threshold of 12. If I take a d8 and I average that out to 4.5, it will always be between the minor and major threshold, so they'll always take 1 HP. But, in fact, if I roll the d8, I can roll a 6, 7, or 8, and that means that will be between the major and severe, and they'll take 2 points of HP. So instead, what we have to do is we have to find the distribution of this damage, the probability of every single number that we roll in that damage, and then see how likely it is that we'll end up in a certain threshold. This is a significant jump from D&D's relatively simple math. To make it more complex, you could have two enemies that deal the same average damage. So let's say we have one enemy that deals 3d8 damage. That is, on average, 13.5 damage. And then you have another enemy that deals 1d8 plus 9. That is also 13.5 damage, but the distribution of the damage is significantly different. Here's my take on how we can calculate the amount of damage we would expect to take from an enemy at a given tier. First, we find a representative damage formula for each tier of play. This means maybe the typical distribution and average damage of an enemy at a given tier. And speaking of, the Daggerheart Manual, they give some improvised monster stats by tier, and they're way off what the monsters provided do. So instead, I had to make a table and calculate what their average damages are and average to hit, and they're much higher than what Daggerheart says they should be. So once we have a representative damage formula, we then can find the probability of every number being rolled in that damage formula. Then we can take that probability and apply it to a character's minor, major, and severe thresholds to see what the chance is that it will land in each of those thresholds. Then we can multiply it by the amount of HP they'd lose at that threshold, and then we could sum that up and say the amount of expected HP we would lose every time we get hit by an enemy in this tier. And then we can multiply that number by the chance of getting hit in general. So then we would have the average amount of HP we would lose every time we get attacked. So let me give you an example so you understand. At tier 0, the average monster damage I have is 2d8. I've just taken all the monster damages and I found the median one. So then we take 2d8 and we see how likely we are to roll the number 2, number 3, number 4, all the way up to number 16. For a level 1 guardian, we have a minor threshold of 3. That means rolling the number 1 and 2 in the damage would give us no damage at all. Here we have a 1.56% chance that we will roll a 2, so we take that and say we have a 1.56% chance that we take no damage at all because it's under our minor threshold. Then our major threshold is 8, so if we tally up the probabilities of being between 3 and 7, we have a 31.25% chance that when a monster hits us, we will lose 1 HP. Then between 8 and 17, our major and severe threshold, we can sum up the remaining probability. And that is a 67.19% chance of landing between these two numbers, and we would lose 2 HP. And in fact, there's no chance we will ever take severe damage using this formula. So 1.56 times 0, plus 31.25 times 1, plus 67.19 times 2, plus 0% times 3 will give us our expected damage we would take when we get hit, which is 1.66 damage. And then we can see how likely we are to get hit at all, and multiply that by the expected HP lost per hit. Guardians have an evasion of 7, and tier 0 monsters have an average bonus to hit of 1, so we have a 75% chance of being hit in general. 1.66 is the damage we get when we get hit, and we have a 75% chance, so when they attack us, we will on average lose 1.24 HP per attack. Now that we know how much HP we lose per attack, we can see how many attacks we can take before dropping. So we take 6 and divide it by 1.24, and we end up with 4.83 attacks 
before we drop. Now there is one itsy bitsy thing I forgot to mention. Armor. Armor is quite different than Daggerheart, and the way it works is when you take damage, you can expend some of your armor in order to reduce that damage. And the amount that you reduce it by is based on your armor score. Your armor score is determined by what type of armor you're wearing, how heavy or how light it is. And note that there are no restrictions on the types of armor a character can wear based on their class. So a wizard can wear light armor or super heavy plate mail, and a guardian can do the same. The way that I take this into account is effectively when you use an armor slot, you are raising your damage thresholds by your armor score amount. So let's say for example you have an armor score of 4. When you use one armor slot, your damage thresholds all rise by 4. That means the damage that you're receiving is all going to move down those thresholds in their probabilities. The tricky thing about this is you don't have an infinite number of armor slots, so you can't do it all the time, and you can use multiples at the same time. So it becomes very dependent on how the user wants to do it. So what I've done in my spreadsheet here, and what you all can change in order to figure it out, is you can select how many armor slots you'll use and see how long you'll last in combat. I'll give you an example here and show you how it works. We're going to continue with the Guardian, and we'll talk about the lowest level armor here, which is the Gambeson armor. This is so light it gives a bonus to your evasion, so now we have a 70% chance of getting hit. Unfortunately though, it only gives a 2 armor score, so it doesn't decrease the damage we take by too much. So if we use one armor slot and reduce the expected damage by 2, that means that we have a 9.38% chance that the damage will fall below our minor threshold, and we don't take any damage at all. We have a 46.88% chance that it'll be between minor and major, and we have a 43.75% chance of it being between major and severe. So things have shifted down and the average damage we take is less. In fact, it's 0.94 HP lost per attack. So I've repeated this thing for all types of armor as well as shields, and here we can see what they look like. Now remember, you can change the amount of armor slots you'll use per attack in this yellow field here. And also, as you're upgrading and leveling up, you can change your minor, major, and severe thresholds up here, as well as the amount of HP you have and the number of armor slots you've got. Hopefully, you'll easily be able to plot out your character progression, see how your level up choices and your armor choices will affect your durability. So in my spreadsheet here, I have generated the results for durability for a Guardian, a Rogue, and a Wizard, and I've done it in all tiers of play for them. And let me point out some of the interesting things I've seen as we've done this. It seems that wearing heavy armor is almost always better, except for in extremely high evasion builds. And this does make sense for a Guardian, you would expect them to be wearing super heavy armor, but it makes a lot of sense for a wizard, and even rogues who are supposed to be very evasive are in fact often better off taking a hit to their evasion in order to have a higher armor score. In this version, 1.4, plate mail gives you a minus one to your agility as well, and I feel like rogues probably won't take that, so I imagine probably not plate, but at least chain mail, and it feels unintuitive. If the heaviest armor is the best armor in almost all circumstances, when do we wear the lighter armor, and what's the benefit there? It feels like it's not really a choice, or it presents it as a choice, and people are going to choose the bad option, because it seems right for the narrative. Of course, they do say that the armor isn't necessarily armor, right? Your wizard wearing full plate might just have some deflective shield up, and that's fine, but maybe then they should rename the armor. But if everyone's better off with higher armor, why have lower armor? I do want to say, wizards are probably even better in higher armor than just this, because they are more likely to take less hits, so they can afford to just splurge all of their armor slots when they do get hit, just to completely negate the hits that they do get. So I'm hoping in future versions, one, things are clearer to a player on what type of armor they should take that's best for them, and two, there are reasons to take other armors. In terms of balance across the tiers, tier 0, 1, 2, 3, it's actually pretty smooth. It's close to the same durabilities across tiers, so it 
hopefully will be a smooth playing experience across the character's lifetime. Tier 2, however, is an outlier. It seems like the damage the monsters deal there are significantly lower than what they should be. Of course, as you get higher, your domain cards become more powerful and your subclass features, so it's hard to say whether the balance at high tiers of play will be better or worse than 5e, but at least from this perspective, it seems like the durability as a base level is pretty good. And in terms of class versus class balance, comparing the Guardian to the Wizard, they start out with some difference, but that divide gets larger and larger over time, as the Guardian's thresholds just increase so much faster than the Wizard's. The Wizard takes a hit, it's very likely to be severe damage when they're in Tier 3. Rogues can soak up a good amount of hits, but Guardians are better at it, and that's what I'm looking for. Hopefully, like I said, they can find that balance between armor score and evasion, but it seems like a pretty fine line to walk. Well, hopefully this was interesting to you, and it wasn't just a bunch of numbers being spewed at you. I thought the differences in optimization and mathematics between Daggerheart and 5e were interesting to point out and see how we can overcome those in terms of build analysis. I am not a mathematician and not a statistician, so if I got some of these things wrong, please let me know and hopefully I can fix that. And also, please take a look at the spreadsheet below, see if it works for you, if you're able to better plot out your character's progression in terms of durability. I'm excited to see where Daggerheart's headed and what it will look like in the future. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe and let me know in the comments below.